Today, I want to talk about something not related to my previous rambling files videos, and not related to the dollar bin, but it's going to be like film related in general. Film related in general. I want to talk about, um, this trend that I've noticed throughout film since, well, it's happening, been happening a lot more often, let's say, since like, after like 2008-ish, after around that time period, um, we we've experienced quite a bit of the remake, um, requels, reboots. We're in the reboot era, so to speak, and sometimes it works. A lot of times. It doesn't. I'm gonna I'm gonna keep these out because you know whole visual aids and stuff like that. At least so my hands have something to do while I'm talking. So we have a couple of the stuff that we have saw in the 2000s, like Michael Bay's Transformers. The Transformers IP was one of the safest ones to emulate into live action, and in, in that 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 point in time, technology had the CG technology and all that stuff had evolved to the point where you could actually make believable um, Autobots and Decepticons and create awesome CG battles and things. But <laughs> Michael Bay decided to focus more on humans, the human characters. And for the first movie, it worked really well. I want to actually say I really like the Michael Bay movies, even though I can understand that everything after the first one is pretty much blah. Like, they got progressively worse with each installment. <laughs> but not the, the, not to say that The Last Night doesn't have things that I find entertaining. Sir Anthony Hopkins is in it, and, it, and they tease Unicron, and had Michael Bay managed to make his sixth movie, that would have been incredible, man. But, um, that's a good, that's one easy example of an IP that was safe to adapt to the films. But at the same time, it also upset a lot of fans of the cartoon shows, particularly G1 Transformers fans. They looked at this and, and they were like, you know, they was like, you guys focus too much on the humans. Why aren't we focusing on the robots, the battles, and the philosophy between um, Optimus and Megatron and all that stuff? It's like, you can understand where they're coming from there, you know, and, and and then we have other ones that I feel arguably worked better for, like, an adaptation. In the 90s, we had TMNT, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Um, this was, like, the first live-action version, like, I believe it was, like, 1990. Like, the turn, it was, was it an 80s movie? Was it a 90s movie? It felt both. It was, it was a really great first movie. Um, I forget his name, but Coteus, Elias Coteus, whatever his name is, he was excellent as Casey Jones. Um, Raphael, him and Raphael, their scenes, that is one of the most quotable movies of all time. And then, about 20 years later, they make, well, more than 20, probably like 25 years later, 25 years later or so, they make another reboot live-action uh, movie with TMNT. Nickelodeon label on it. Nickelodeon bought the IP. And that one was okay. It wasn't as good as the 90s TMNT movies, but it w had its own flair and even got itself a sequel. And I'd argue that that sequel is very fun. It has some very fun battles in it. It's very cartoony, though. It, it felt like a live-action cartoon. And, um, if you were going to go for a live-action movie, you need to justify why you're making it live-action. Because otherwise, if you're going to make something that's just a cartoony movie, just to make a cartoon movie, you know? It's just... Whatever. Now we're going to get into more questionable territories. Let's talk about... Horror remakes! Now, we've been doing this for a while. There's a lot of horror remakes. Um, the House of Wax remake in, the, I think it was the 50s, of the 30s, um, Mystery of the Wax Museum House, death or whatever. Um, and then there's The Thing, The Thing that everybody loves, John Carpenter's The Thing, that was a remake of 
I think it was called The Thing from Another World or something, in the old black and white movie. And people, an argument, like, like almost objectively think that the John Carpenter's The Thing is far superior. And I would be in agreement of it. Not that the original isn't worth watching as well. Then there's um, House on Haunted Hill. I believe that was made in 2000, 1999 to 2000. House on Haunted Hill was a remake of the film of the same name starring Vincent Price, and it was also pretty good. I, I would argue that a lot of remakes prior to the year 2000 were very faithful and very imaginative and, and pretty creative, but at the same time bringing to life in new directions those characters that you knew and love. The dynamic between... Um, the Price character, Mr. Price, they called him Mr. Price as homage to Vincent Price, who played the character in the original movie, and his wife that's played by Famke Jensen, th th that was a very good dynamic that we didn't see as deeply in the original. And I would argue it was very entertaining. I would argue the people that got to play those characters were very entertaining. It was a very entertaining movie. Now, let's switch forward to, say, um, the 2000s, the late 2000s, you get the slasher revivals, you get your Friday the 13th, you get Rob Zombie's Halloween, you get the Nightmare on Elm Street, you gotta keep, we gotta keep going through, we got Child's Play in the 2010s, um, they were getting all of these guys, and they were just, um, out of a couple of months, some of them were uh, faithful, some of them were pretty faithful, Rob Zombie's Halloween was very, very faithful to the original, as I talked about in my previous video. Now, the Friday the 13th one, though, now that I've finally watched the first Friday the 13th, the reboot of Friday the 13th, starring um, Jared Padalecki, is not faithful. It's a completely different direction that they took that story, though I would argue it's just as entertaining to watch, because the kill is very fun to watch, Jason is very fun to watch coming back again, but it's not that same uh, story from the first three movies. It's it's very different. I mean, they, they, it's like they looked at the third one onwards and said, alright, we're just gonna go with the third one. We're gonna talk about the third one and create our own killable cast of characters and all that. And it, 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 it succeeds in some places, it doesn't succeed in others. And then we have Nightmare on Elm Street. Nightmare on Elm Street was, at least in my opinion, one of the worst horror remakes of all time. Um, Robert England was one of the, is the best Freddy now, I argue that the one who played Freddy in New Nightmare was also very good. He was scary, Freddy. He brought sc Freddy back to scary from, like, the first um, first couple of uh, Nightmare on Elm Streets. That Freddy in New Nightmare was very good, but that wasn't a remake. It wasn't a remake of the first Nightmare. It was a meta take on on scares and, and, and creating a ha, a, a ha horror movie with Wes, Wes Craven at the helm, which was like the prototype to Scream. After he made New Nightmare, he had the idea for Scream. He liked looked at the, the at Hollywood and, and horror movies in general, and by the time of Scream 3, you could tell he had a lot to say behind the camera that he put onto the film screen. It was very fun. It, he was very, it was very fun. But then we get Child's Play, and it's almost a completely different story. They're getting more and more, more, uh, what's the word, bold in their changes. But at the same time, they want to revive old IPs. They want to make a new IP, because new IPs don't sell as well, because they have to try harder to push it. But with an old IP, the IP itself will sell the product half the time. And that's, that's the f next one we're going to need to talk about here. IP marketing. Versus, uh, so I'm going to make a second line here. IP marketing versus new ideas. Now, we've seen this in horror sequels, too. The Hellraiser sequels, you know. Um, the Hellraiser sequels, after 4, the direct video ones, up to, say, 9? I want to say 9, because the 10th one, I believe, was made to be a Hellraiser movie, Judgment. But up to 9, so it's 5 to 9, were not originally Hellraiser films. 
they were written screen the scripts were written to be something else like the fifth one is made to be it's like some sort of Jacob's Ladder um, ripoff and so was the sixth one they were both very Jacob's Ladder you know they were very Lynchian and then they decided to adapt Hell Pinhead and Hellraiser into those scripts and made them Hellraiser 5 and Hellraiser 6. Deader, Hellraiser Deader was not intended to be a Hellraiser film either, but they adapted Hellraiser into it. They rewrote Hellraiser into it. And Hellworld was not really a Hellraiser movie, though. I believe that I, I want to say that they wanted to make kind of like a new nightmare take on, but it, with Hellraiser, and they didn't quite stick the landing. <laughs> because th when you have your villain not be, well, not necessarily villain, so to speak, you know, the villain in the first Hellraiser was Frank, not Pinhead. But the big scare, the big spooky, when you have that be somebody not Pinhead in your post-Halloween, um, you know, not Halloween, um, Hellraiser 3, Pinhead was the villain. Hellraiser 4, Pinhead was one of the villains. Um... In Hellraiser 5, the villain is the Engineer, and I would argue the Engineer, who is just smooshed into being Pinhead, is not exactly good. Pinhead is not exactly a good villain there. The Engineer is. The Engineer takes all of the credit there. And in the sixth one, the best, most charismatic villain, so to speak, is the good cop, bad cop thing with the, with the whole uh, Mayhem guy. I'm just going to call him Mayhem guy. I don't know his name. He's the Mayhem guy from the Mayhem commercials. Um, and in Debtor, the villain is Le Machan, the man, the guy with the Debtor cult. And Pinhead's just written into the story, and it's just, nah. You didn't even need to call him Le Machan, you know? Because they just did that because they saw Hellraiser 4, and they wanted to tie it in. So they just tweak the scripts very slightly and tie it in. And that's kind of the uh, basic gist of the argument between IP marketing versus the new ideas. These scripts were not intended to be Hellraiser movies. They're, they were new ideas. They were original ideas that, that they wanted to adapt into their own film. But they saw that it could be adapted into a Hellraiser sequel using the Hellraiser IP as the marketing in and of itself so they didn't have to push too much money into the marketing to push this film. It's just, hey, here's Hellraiser 5, direct -to video Hey, here's Hellraiser 6, direct -to video And it's like that script that probably would have gone, faded into obscurity as an, as an indie flick or whatever got transformed into this instead. And then we get into an even more blatant um, IP marketing versus new ideas trick. It's where they take the IP, the, o the older IP, Let's say, as I've clearly said for plenty of videos before, I'm going to use it as my example this time as well. Rings of Power, though they've done it with any, plenty of other stuff. Quantum Leap, um, Doctor Who, uh, Star Trek, Star Wars. There's a lot of stuff out there that are big IPs, but these guys have different ideas than they want to put it into a film, but, but they don't want to just make a new I, new IP. They want to use the old IP. The marketing, the audience is already there. The people is are already there that will go to watch it. But you want to put your new ideas in. You want to put your new messages in. You want to put your movie into this IP, if that makes sense. Um, the best analogy that I can make this next point that I'm going to have here is imagination. Imagination versus real estate. Estate imagination. What does that mean? Imagination versus real estate imagination. Alright, so main imagination, your original imagination would be like the first Nightmare on Elm Street. The first one, Wes Craven's original idea, Wes Craven's own imagination creating that world. Versus real estate imagination is a filmmaker comes in to see that this old, takes this old IP and buys that idea. They buy that IP to insert their own movie into that IP. Real estate imagination, they're taking somebody else's imagination and putting their own movie into it. They're putting their own thing into that IP. It happens all the time. It happens all the time to varying degrees of success. And to varying degrees of moral is this okay to do-ness. 
And I would argue that for a lot of things, it's not our okay to do, particularly in things like Tolkien and things like uh, Robert Jordan, those types of um, IPs, Wheel of Time, uh, Rings of Power, those big, big, big IPs that you procure for yourself. You're basically looking at, you're basically taking this other person's imagination, this other person's world, this other person's character. They did all the hard work for you. They created everything there for you. And now you could take it like a bunch of Lego pieces and you can play with it all you like in your own little script. You can change it. You could take off this Lego piece's head, put somebody, put other person's head on there. You can do whatever you want with that IP. You're playing with somebody else's Lego set, creating your own story with it. And I would argue that if you're not honoring that original LEGO set's owner's idea, how they built that set, how they built that IP, if you're not honoring that and trying to make something that they could have made had they still been around to make it, you probably shouldn't do that. And particularly market it as if you're doing that. Because the fans of that IP... The fans of that original product, that series, they know the characters, they know the books, they know that product. And they look at your product and they can they know exactly what you're doing. They can see exactly what you're doing when you put your own ideas into there. You're moving aside the old IPs, real estate. You're buying that real estate, putting your own stuff in there. You're taking and moving about the other person's land and their characters, and you're playing with it. You're basically fan fictioning into that other person's world and making money off of your fan fiction. You bought the IP. You bought the I you bought the right to do that. So technically you're 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 in the rights to do that. But it's not so much as can you do that, as Ian Malcolm says in Jurassic Park, it's should you do that? Should you take uh, imagination's real estate and just use that real estate, free real your imagine that other person's real estate to, to do your own thing in? Or should you use your own imagination and create your own IP instead of using or creating your fantasy story that has nothing to do with the Rings of Power but but you wanted to use Lord of the Rings as IP because that already has an audience Rings of Power has an audience that you can use that you can market that you just say hey this is Lord of the Rings it's the story is not Lord of the Rings at all this entire first season has nothing to do with the story in in, in, in the second age it has nothing to do with it nothing to do with it at all Barry the characters existed and then a lot of the characters actually existed in the second age so that's uh, that's about as 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 accurate as, as it gets. After that, these characters that existed there, that's it. They're not doing anything that actually existed in that IP storyline. They're making their own thing. They're making their own story, their own movie, their own show. And I would argue that if you're going to make something so f completely foreign to this original IP that you're basically changing almost everything about it, that all of these characters that share these names from these original characters in name only, their personalities, their, their actions, their motivations, all of these things are completely different from that original IP that... They could be anybody. You could just change their name, and we wouldn't even know that they were originally this other character. You could give the character of Galadriel a completely different name. You could call her Loradol or whatever, Loradriel or Lorindian or whatever, whatever, and, and and you would you would nobody would know that that was originally <laughs> nobody would know because they're so foreign to that original idea. And that's what I see a lot in a lot of these other IPs, in Quantum Leap's reboot, remake, in Star Trek's reboot, remake. And there's a lot of things that they're taking these old, pre-established ideas, but they're making them into completely foreign, and, f and they're, they're only that same thing in name only. But after that name only, it's something completely different. So what I would argue then is, instead of just making a Star Trek reboot, make the next Star Trek original IP. It's a different IP. It's a different fantasy, uh, sci-fi fantasy series. And try to make your own thing. 
imagination versus real estate imagination. Real estate imagination, basically, instead of you building your own house, you buy somebody else's house they're selling. You know, you buy a house versus building a house. When you build that house, you could be the own, your own architect. You could say, I want the bathroom to be here. I want it to be this much square footage. Oh, I want there to be a pool in the backyard. I want this much to be here. I want a fence to be here. You could design that thing however you want. And since you're building it from the ground up, it's not somebody else's house that you're buying that you could remodel. You're building your own thing. You have complete control over what you want to do there. No matter what idea, no matter what message you want to put into it, you have the complete power to do that. You have the complete power to add whatever you wanted into that, that house. But when you buy a house that was already built by somebody else, they were already designed by somebody else, their own their ideas, their own idea with square footage and all that stuff, and you decide, all right, I'm just going to buy this house, I'm going to tear it down, and I'm going to build my own house. It's like, why would, why would you... <laughs> it's like, why would you do that? Why would you do that instead of just building your own house? That's what I see with a lot of things. Rings of Power, Quantum Leap. It's like they bought this house only to tear it down and build their own house! When they could have just built their own house from the start. Why didn't you just do that? And then I look at all of these um, um, progressive things that that, 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 that journalism and media are talking about, saying, and like the Rings of Power, how this is the first female dwarf of color, or this first d d d elf of color, and it's like, why? Why is that the first one? There was d no law or limitation saying that you couldn't do this in literally anything else that has ever existed. You couldn't just, like, create your own IP with your own fantasy world, and you had complete control. If you wanted to make every single dwarf um, of, of a color, you have the complete control to do that because it's your own IP. It's your it's your own world at that point. Nobody can tell you how to do that because you're basically boldly going where no one has gone before to quote Star Trek. It's your own exploration into your own imagination. Well, if you ever looked at a movie that ended in a way that you disagreed with, if you've ever looked at the movie that you disagreed with, the TV show that you disagreed with, the video games ending that you disagreed with, a character may have died that you didn't want to die, and maybe you wrote a fan fiction where you changed that ending, where you changed that character not dying. Like, I did that when I was like 10 years old. I, those, if you look on this channel's history, the, one of the older videos, I introduced you to that whole box of little spiral notebooks where I did scribbles where I used to... Um, have an insert character go in and rewrite endings to shows that I didn't like. And that was fan fiction, so to speak. And that's what I feel is happening in professionalism, you know? They're basically rewriting things that they didn't like, putting their own insert characters into this world and writing their own things. And you could say that they can do that. But should they do that? At some point, when I was like maybe 13 to 14, I stopped having my insert character go into previously made IPs. I was starting to add my own storylines. I was starting to add my own characters. By the time I was 17 to 18, I had completely scrapped um, this these other... Um, worlds that I had my character go to that I'd, that were already pre-created, and I ended up just creating my own! Because I preferred to have my own world that I had complete control over! That I could do whatever the heck I wanted in! That I could make whatever character look however I wanted, and nobody could tell me they couldn't because it was my own world! I created it myself! I wasn't doing real estate imagination, taking somebody else's thing and saying, oh, I don't care about that, I'm going to rewrite, write this out, write this in, fill this in. I didn't, I started to do that less and less and moved into my own territory, my own uncharted territory of my own imagination. 
and I found more satisfaction doing that versus just um, saying, oh, I just want to rewrite Tolkien and put my own thing in there. Why would you want to rewrite Tolkien when you could just be the next Tolkien? Instead of taking Middle-earth, make your own! And that would have been so much cooler! That's when I look at this, this, this first season of Rings of Power, and I see all of these unique characters, these created characters, and while the dialogue might feel weak, these characters could, are fine! They're fine! They may not work for, for, for this setting, for this IP, but you could have put some this into your own created IP. This could have been something completely different from Tolkien. It could not be Middle-Earth at all. It could be your own planet. Call it Gaia. Call it Goraxicon the Third. Whatever. <laughs> and you could do whatever you wanted there. Instead, you're doing whatever you wanted in some other person's yard. And I argue that you probably shouldn't do that. Because you have the power of your own imagination. You can go into completely uncharted territories, craft your own worlds. If you look at the fantasy IP and you say, hey, they don't have too much representation of this in this race. Well, hey, instead you could do that! You could be the first one to do that! You can make your cr whole kingdom full of that thing that you thought that doesn't have too much representation in this genre. You could be the first one to do it! You can create your own IP and be the first one to make this awesome kingdom and build and craft that political system and make your own messages from whatever you wanted! <laughs> you could have done- you could do that! You, the viewer, you could do that! You could look at, at, at anything from science fiction to action to fantasy to horror to whatever. And if you think that there's something that's not represented enough, you could be the first one to make it all about that in your own IP. You could be that first one. You could be the pioneer. You could be the innovator in imagination. Instead of going buying somebody else's real estate and putting your own ideas into it, Build your own house.